And all God's people say it. Amen. Amen. Take your Bibles and turn to Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5. We're going to start reading in verse number 1. Romans 5, verse 1. Today we're going to spend Christmas in Rome, and I got one more message from Romans. This is it. Amen? <laughs> hey, you might as well, if you start the fall with Romans, you might as well end it with Romans. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which now we stand. And we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Not, not only so, but we rejoice also in our sufferings. Because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance character, and character hope. And this hope that we have does not disappoint us. Because God has poured out his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit whom he has given us. You see, just at the right time, when we were still powerless... Christ died for the ungodly. That's you and that's me. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous man, though for a good man someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? For if, when we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? Not only is this so, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we now have received reconciliation. This is the word of the Lord for the people of the Lord. And if you are glad that you, we have his word and his Holy Spirit, say amen. All right, now, here we go. I have heard people say this Christmas season, and maybe I'm just paying more attention to it, I don't know. Um, I've heard more people say, I wish that this feeling, um, and what they're talking about, they're talking about, talking about the Christmas spirit. I wish that this feeling or this Christmas spirit would, would last all year long. Um, I was at Walmart, and I turned around to a lady several weeks ago, and we began to talk, and I was talking about Christmas, and a good opener is, you know, are you ready for Christmas? And she said, no, I'm not. And uh, we started talking about the Christmas spirit, and I wanted to lead into inviting her to church. And, um, and I said, yeah, I've heard a lot of people say that they wish that this uh, feeling lasted all year long. And she said, yes, I wish that this feeling would last all year long in other people. And I thought, that, <laughs> I didn't know what to say. Uh, Merry Christmas. But anyway. But, but, but there is something different. There's a different feeling to Christmas. And Christmas may have um, a spirit to it. I mean, there's no doubt about it. And what people want is the notion that all is calm and all is bright. Um, people want the notion to come true that joy has really come into this world. And there is no doubt in my mind that what people want, ultimately, is the joy of God through Jesus Christ. That's it. Every Christmas ornament, every Christmas tree, every Christmas present, every Christmas movie, every Christmas cantata, everything, I believe, is man's deep down desire, whether they know it or not, whether they recognize it or not, is the desire to have the joy of God through Jesus Christ. Yes, even the most strident-hardened atheist. I believe, wants the joy of God through Jesus Christ. But instead, a lot of times, even as Christians, we settle for a fleeting season. We settle for fleeting emotions that only last two months. But joy, real joy, can be had. It can be had. I mean, there is a joy that passes all understanding on December the 26th. There is a joy that passes all understanding that can be had on January the 2nd. But this joy, this real joy, this everlasting joy must be rooted in something more permanent. It must be rooted in something everlasting. It must be rooted in something forever, something mighty, something strong, something loving, something merciful, something gracious, something truthful. If it is not, then it is not joy. 
And all you have is a fleeting feeling or just a circumstantial happiness. And so I say again that if we want real joy, 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 everlasting joy, it has to be rooted in the person of God based on the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross and the empty tomb. That is why the Apostle Paul said in Philippians 4, 4, he said, rejoice in the Lord. He said, if you're going to rejoice, rejoice literally into the Lord. Put your joy, put your happiness, put all your emotions, put them into the Lord. That is the sphere of our rejoicing. It should be our sphere of rejoicing, not a season. Even though I love the Christmas season, I, I, my family will tell you, I love Christmas. I love Christmas. Love it, love it, love it. And we're going to celebrate hard and we're going to party hard. But my rejoicing is not in the season. My rejoicing is not in a holiday. My rejoicing is not in a Christmas peak. But my rejoicing, if I want real joy, must be in something much larger than me, much larger than this universe, more permanent, more mighty, more loving, more gracious, more truthful, and that is the Lord. And that is why Paul said in Philippians 4, 4, rejoice into the Lord. And again, I say, emphatically, rejoice in the Lord. Now, there's not a precise definition of joy in the Bible. You're not going to find it. But what you can do is you can read from Genesis to Revelation, and you can come up with a definition of joy. Let me give you my definition of joy. This is my definition of joy, all right? Joy is the realization of God's peace, God's love, and God's hope through Jesus Christ our Lord. I think that's a pretty fairly good working definition of joy. And I would have it on the screen, but it's okay. Y- y'all can just be good listeners this morning. Be expositional listeners this morning. Joy is the realization of God's peace, of God's love, of God's hope through the person of Jesus Christ, made real through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, and we remember it by reading God's Word. It's God's telling us that everything is going to be okay. It's telling us that everything is going to be all right. And boy, I'm going to tell you something. If there are two chapters in the Bible that, that are just manifestos, recipes, algorithms of God's joy, it is Romans 5 and Romans 8. Man, just the opening salvo of Romans chapter 8. There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. There is now no condemnation. None, zilch, not a none who are in Christ Jesus. And if you are in Christ Jesus this morning, that really ought to give you the Christmas spirit. Amen. And then he goes on to say in in chapter 8 that we are not bound to the sinful nature, but we are bound to the nature that can please God. And we are not controlled by the sinful nature. Not only that, but he goes on to say that we are adopted into the family of God. Now we can go before the throne of God and call God our Father, Daddy, or Abba. Not only that, but he says in verse 18, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. He gives us the promise of heaven. And my, what heaven will be. Amen? But until that time, you know, whenever we um, are so bogged down with, with suffering and just hurt and being wounded, and all of us have been wounded at some point, or that some of us are dealing with woundedness right now, Whenever we get to that point and we cannot pray like we want to or we cannot articulate how we feel, the Holy Spirit takes our prayers and takes them before the throne of God. Merry Christmas, amen? What a Christmas gift. And then he goes on and he says that, that we know that in all things God's work, God works for the good of those who love him. Not only that, but then he says no one can bring a charge. No one can accuse God's elect. And then he says we are more than conquerors. Nothing can separate us from the love of Christ Jesus. My friends, that is joy. And think about it. That's what the world wants. That's what the world wants. And let me be so bold to say this morning, if you are here without Christ, that is what you want. That is what you need That's what the world wants. That's what the world desires. That's what the world tries to finance. That's what the world tries to buy. Listen to the songs of the world. Listen to the song, I mean, literal songs of the world. Listen to them. Listen to the conversations of the world. And if you listen closely in every song, in every conversation, there is a desire for the peace and love and hope of God. I mean, look, watch what the world produces. Take, for instance, the Hallmark Channel. 
Yes, please take it. Amen? <laughs> Cast it into outer darkness. I have never seen a basic plot develop so many ways and so many times. Where's Stephen Halbert? Amen. Where's Stephen? I mean, amen. I mean, I mean, it's the same plot over and over again. And really, if you take the Hallmark Channel, it's really, and I know some of y'all go, you party pooper. I mean, it's really, we want, you know what romance is? Some of you guys are like, don't what? Romance? Anyway, you know what romance is? It's really a wanting of God as your ultimate lover. And so the world wants peace. That inner peace that makes sense out of life. The peace that, yes, you can find satisfaction in life knowing that you are right with God. The world wants love. Someone that will love us no matter what. Someone that will love us unconditionally. What you look like, what you have done. Someone will still love us, but someone that will love us enough to say that you're wrong. To say you can change. Speak the truth in love. Someone, you know, that, that can bring us hope. The hope that life is not fleeting. The, the hope that brings answers to the three questions of life, the three philosophical questions of life. Where did I come from? Why am I here? Where am I going? And the only thing that can answer that in any type of satisfaction is Christianity. It is a hope whenever we look into the grave, our grave, knowing that it's not the end. Well, the Bible shows us that true peace. The Bible shows us that true love, that true hope, that brings true joy, everlasting joy. And just for a moment, if you will just hang with me, I want us to go to um, Romans chapter 5, and I want us to see how we can experience the spirit of Christmas all year long. Okay? First of all, peace. The Bible tells us that we can have peace from God and peace with God. In chapter 5, verse 1, it says, Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom, through Jesus, we have gained access by faith into this grace by which we stand. Peace, think about it, true peace, comes from being justified. It doesn't come from the State Department. It doesn't come from being politically correct or any of these other political, philosophical things of the world. But Paul tells us that true peace comes from being justified. You see, what does justified mean? Justified means simply this, that we have been declared righteous by an almighty God. That's what justification is. It's a declaration. We, we talked about this months ago, that it is, it is a declaration, an announcement from God, a permanent declaration from God that we have been made right with God. But in order to understand justification, you have to see a courtroom. It is where a guilty man comes before God the judge, and God the judge declares him innocent. Innocent on the basis of what Jesus Christ has done for this guilty person. Jesus Christ took my sins, and he died for my sins, and because he died for my sins, I am clothed with his righteousness. Amen? And justification does not come from works. It does not come from goodness. It does not come from morality. It comes from Jesus Christ. In verse 6, it says, you see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. That's you. That's you and me. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous man, though for a good man someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his love for us in this while we were still sinners, while we were still in our sins, Christ died for us. It comes by knowing Jesus Christ. That's it. You cannot be justified. You cannot have peace any other way except through Jesus Christ our Lord. Can I just give you a personal illustration this morning about what, sal what kind of peace salvation will bring you. In 1992, January 7th or 9th, I can't remember, Jill, which one, 7th or 9th, I was coming back from school, and, and I was coming over a hill, and as I was coming over a hill in Bluntville, Tennessee, 
there in my lane facing me was a car going about 45 miles an hour, 50 miles an hour. And that car hit me straight head on. And man, it wasn't a Prius. It was a Barracuda. Do y'all remember what a bar? I mean, son, that's American steel, son. I mean, that is a hardened steel car. And it hit me, and, and, and just for a moment, they say your life will flash in front of your eyes. Yes, it will. Yes, it will. Yes, it will. I thought to myself, I'm a dead man. That's what I thought. I thought, I'm dead. And man, that car hit me, and my car, my little Mitsubishi, just went poof. It puffed up like that. And, and, I, and I couldn't breathe. And some of you physicians can, can diagnose this, but I couldn't breathe, and, and, I, felt, and, I, and I was, felt blood just going down the back of my throat. And I thought, I'm dying. I'm dying. And I put my head on my headrest. And I said, Lord... I'm coming. Take care of my family. And it was peaceful. I didn't want to die. But I really thought I was dead. And there was just a peace, the peace of God, that just ruled over me. And obviously I didn't die. And I thought to myself, if I'm going to die, I'm not going to die in this car. And so I pushed the door open. I fell out into the road. That was real smart. And um, I fell out into the road. And long story short, but, but folks, I, we can have peace through our Lord Jesus Christ. We can have peace that our sins are forgiven, and this is not the end. And the Bible also says we can experience the love of God. What a tremendous verse, but God demonstrates his own love for us or toward us. In that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Ever since the fall of man in Genesis chapter 3, God has been demonstrating his love to a lost and unbelieving world. And this demonstration of love reaches its perfect zenith, its perfect height in Jesus Christ, God's best, God in the flesh, Emmanuel. That's what Christmas is all about. That's what it's all about. We have to remind ourselves that all the time, and that is why we had that pithy little saying, Jesus is the reason for the season. And I know people get, get, get tired of that, but it is true. He is the reason for the season. God sent his son to this earth to show us and to demonstrate his love for us. God in the flesh. And I've told you over and over and over again, I will not sacrifice my children for any of you. No, don't even ask me to do that. I'm not going to do it. Even when I get really aggravated with my children, I'm not going to sacrifice them for you. No. And if anyone sacrifices their child for another person, it is just absolutely unbelievable love or it's insanity. But God did it for you. And he did it for me. And the word demonstrate means to bring together. God demonstrated his love to bring two things together, God and man, and he did it through the mediator, Jesus Christ. This is the love of God. And the love of God just doesn't save us and leave us. No, the love, what does the love of God do? The love of God transforms us. It speaks truth to us. That's what it does. And so God brings us true peace, he brings us true love, and he brings us true hope. Now follow with me, just, and I end with this. We have peace, we can have peace, that our sins have been forgiven. You say, Aaron, but I'm visiting here, you know, you don't know what I have done. I don't know what you have done, and I probably will never know what you have done, but God knows what you have done, and still John 3.16 is still in the Word of God, amen? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. We can have peace that our sins are forgiven. We can have the peace that the ultimate person of the universe, God, loves us. 
and has demonstrated his love toward us. Not only that, but this God who loves us and gives us this peace and gives us this hope wants to make us like his son, Jesus Christ. And it says in chapter 6, not only that, but Paul is, is teaching, he's pointing to the fact that one day we will rise again. Now, I don't want to get ahead of myself and get to Easter, but yeah, let's just go on there anyway. Amen? In Romans chapter uh, 6 and verse 4, we were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Jesus Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. Amen. Verse 8, now if we died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. For we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, he cannot die again. Death no longer has mastery over him. The death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lived, he lives to God. Death has no mastery, child of God. And this is the greatest hope that we have. That if Christ is risen, then we will rise. If, there is no, if death has no hold on Christ, then death has absolutely no hold on us. No hold. Amen? Amen. And the Apostle Paul says, and we rejoice, and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. The word rejoice there means a triumphant, rejoicing confidence. It means a boasting, that we can boast. This Christmas, whenever you're gathered around the dinner table, the Christmas tree, man, party on, amen, party on. But boast in Jesus Christ. Boast in Jesus Christ. The Apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, he says, where, O death, where, O death, is your sting? Where, O grave, is your victory? You know what Paul is doing? He's boasting in Jesus Christ. Because Paul had the hope and the love. He realized the love of Jesus Christ in his life. And friends, with that, with that, we can know that we can have this feeling all season long, all season long. This is a picture of, I've never been there, some of y'all have been there, of the Colosseum in Rome. And I think this is probably one of the neatest pictures I think I've ever seen. It's amazing what you can find online. Isn't it great? I didn't take this picture. All right. But in that Colosseum, probably even where that cross is, many, many Christians died. You know why they died? For preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. For living the gospel of Jesus Christ. And you know what? They didn't have what we have today. They didn't have a Christmas season. They, they didn't have Lifeway. They didn't have the Martyr Study Bible. I mean, they didn't have any of these things. You know what they had? You know what they had? They had the peace and the love and the hope of God through Jesus Christ. That's what they had. And I'm just going to get a little bit graphic with you, if that's all right. You know what they would do? They would dress Christians in animal clothes, even their children in animal clothes, and they would release starved lions and animals and dogs, and these animals would come and rip them apart. What in the world? would keep a person in that Colosseum standing, giving glory to God whenever that is happening. i tell you what it is. It is the hope of God. It is the peace of God. It is a relentless love for God and a realization of God's love. And whenever the Colosseum games were going on back in the day, if you would have stand and you would, if you would have said, you know, the glory of Rome will fade, but the glory of Christ will be forever, they would laugh you to scorn. They would say, you've got to be kidding me. Look at Rome. Look at the Colosseums. Look at all the great architecture. And by the way, have you been to Athens? What a town. What intellectuals in Athens. Are you kidding me? This this. Jew that was born in Bethlehem that came out of Nazareth. And by the way, Nazareth, I don't know if you've heard, is the wrong side of the tracks. He, his glory will reign forever and Rome will fade. You know what Rome is today? I hear tell. You know what the glory of Rome is today? It's ruins. 
It's ruins. It's ruins. But here we are in 2018 giving glory to God for His Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. And you know what? That's all they had. That's all they had. So this season, don't look to Rome for your peace. Don't look to Athens. Don't look to Hollywood. Don't look to New York City. Look to Jesus Christ. He's the only thing that can bring joy to the world. In closing, I would like to um, read to you the hymn, Joy to the World. I just want to read it to you, so get ready. Did you know that Joy to the World is not a Christmas carol? It's not. It's a hymn about the second coming of Jesus Christ. Um, Clay was telling me that, um, that in their hymn class on Wednesday night, we teach our, Pastor Clay and Travis, they teach our, our children doctrine and hymns on Wednesday nights. He said that jo Jasper Hare, whenever Clay told him that Joy to the World was a song about the second coming, Jasper Hare said, he said, but Pastor Clay, he said, if this is a song about the second coming, who's going to sing it after he comes? <laughs> and a child shall leave them. Amen. Joy to the world, the Lord is come. Let earth receive her King. Let every heart prepare Him room, and heaven and all nature sing. And heaven and nature sing, and heaven and nature sing, and heaven and heaven and nature sing. Joy to the world, the Savior reigns. My Savior reigns. Let men their songs employ. Why fields and floods, rocks, hills, and plains, repeat the sounding joy. Repeat the sounding joy. Repeat, repeat the sounding joy. No more let sin and sorrows grow, nor thorns infest the ground. He comes to make his blessings flow, far as the curse is found. Far as the curse is found. Ready? Far as, far as the curse is found. And he rules the world with truth and grace. And I love this. And he makes the nations prove the glories of his righteousness and wonders of his love and wonders of his love, and wonders and wonders of his love. This morning, if you are without Christ, you don't have joy. Now, you may have happiness, and you may have the peace that the world gives, but you don't have everlasting joy and hope and love, and peace. And let me be so bold to say that you cannot find everlasting peace in your spouse. You can't find it in your children. You can't find it in your grandchildren. Let's just be honest, you can't. You can't find it in the material things, your job, your degrees, or anything like that. It comes through Jesus Christ. And if you would like to know true peace, true, true peace, true, true hope, true, true love, joy, it comes by realizing that you're a sinner. Book of Romans, chapter 3, verse 23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. It also says that the wages of sin is death. It's death. And because we have sinned against God, we have fallen we have died spiritually, and we will die physically one day. 
But the Bible tells us that if we believe that we're sinners and we know we're sinners and we believe that Jesus Christ came to this earth and he took our sins upon himself and he paid the penalty for our sins, they put him in a borrowed tomb. Three days later, he came out of the grave. I believe he came up. Amen? I believe he rose again. And if we believe in that and if we confess our sins and we cry out to the Lord and we repent of our sins, the Bible says we will be saved That's not in the Southern Baptist handbook. That's in the Word of God. And when we realize that we are saved, we'll begin to realize that peace and that love and that hope and that everlasting joy that comes by knowing Jesus Christ. I pray that you have done that. I pray that you have done that this morning. I pray that you will come and you will receive Christ. Or you might want to hang out after the service and say, Aaron, look, you know... I've heard a lot about Jesus. I've heard a lot about Jesus all of my life. Or you may be a seeker and and you're just now finding things out about Jesus Christ. I want to know how I can be saved, how I can be right with God, how I can have this joy. I need joy. You don't know what I'm going through, Aaron. You don't know what I've been through. I just need that joy. You can have that joy today. You come, you come, even if it's after the service. Child of God, like me, you have to be reminded about what we actually have in Jesus Christ. No one can steal your joy, child of God. I know we say, well, so-and-so stole my joy. Nobody can steal your joy. Stop saying that. Amen? You. Oy vey. Stop saying that. No one can steal your joy. You allow people to, you know, to... Get your attention away from the peace and love and hope of God. And like me, you all need to be reminded today that, listen, folks, our joy is eternal. It's everlasting. But it's in Jesus Christ. But as Christians, we get our mind off on little shiny objects and we follow them. And we find out, unfortunately, in the end, they don't give us anything that we really, really need in life. Come back, child of God. Come back and realize that He is our true joy. One more thing. Some of y'all might be saying, Pastor, are you sure about this? Take Pascal's wager. Go try to find it somewhere else. Go try to find it somewhere else. You can't. Come to Christ. Come to Christ. Joy to the world. Amen? Amen. Let's bow our head and close our eyes. Why don't we just go ahead and stand this morning as Pastor Clay comes and prepares to lead us through our invitation. This morning, the invitation's open, child of God. The altar's open. If you would like to come and pray, If you would like to even come and join Edwards Road Baptist Church, if the Holy Spirit's leading you, you come. This morning, if if you just need, right where you're at, you don't have to come to, the, the altar is not magical. But right where you're at, if you would just like to say, Lord, Lord, remind me of what Christmas is all about, that eternal, everlasting joy through Jesus Christ our Lord. You do that right where you're at. Brothers and sisters, we don't seek joy. In Rome, we go to Bethlehem, to Calvary, in the person of Jesus Christ. So this morning, if you don't know Christ, I pray that you'll come. If you do know Christ and you have forgotten or put on the shelf the joy, the realization of that joy, I pray that you'll, your mind will be transformed anew this morning, that you will come back to Him. And I pray that we'll all pray that today, tomorrow, and the 25th, that our celebrations will be centered in the person of Jesus Christ. Yes, that we will have fun eating and being with family and receiving and giving presents, but let's remember, it's all about Him. Father, be glorified 
In the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, through the power of your Holy Spirit, in all of our thoughts and our meditations during this invitation, in Jesus' name, amen.